So welcome everyone and welcome especially to, um, to our speakers today, Jessica Ferhaish and, uh, and also Mafalda Korea Nunish, who is uh, co-author on the paper that, uh, that this get together is based on. And uh, I thought I'd say a couple of words um, about Jessica and um, about Mafalda. They are both interested in themes of urban greening, gentrification, planning, and, uh, and it's interesting because at least uh, Jessica brings together uh, an interest in human geography and in urban spatial planning. Is that right? And, um, and then ha have worked briefly together in Lisbon as well, where Mafalda has an interest in global models and processes of culture-led urban development. So I think the intersection of, uh, of their work uh, is very appropriate for the theme of the paper today, which is about whether Lisbon's urban greening strategies can actually advance environmental justice. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll have some more to say about this based on an interest in not only urban regeneration, but also in, in public participatory processes and uh, what it really means to have not just a uh, shift towards more sustainable infrastructure in an ecological sense, but uh, also in ways that advance ideals of social equity um, and the kind of tensions that appear across sectors. Um, I, I think we'll hear more when you get underway. And uh, there's a couple of us in the room here. Rates have been, uh, of COVID incidents have been going up, but some have braved it over to campus. And then it's nice to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of you in the room as well. So after the next 20, 25 minutes of a talk, we will, as usual, go into a, a question and answer and discussion session until the end of the hour. So over to you, Jessica and uh, Mafalda. Great. Thank you so much, Sid. That was a very nice introduction. Um, so I'll just start with uh, sharing my screen um, so I can show you the presentation. Um, yes, so we are here uh, today to, to present our paper on uh, Lisbon's urban greening strategies in relation to environmental justice. And thank you very much, Sid, for inviting us, for presenting our work. Um, so before we go into the actual research, I just wanted to point out that um, the paper is very much the result of a collaboration between me and my father. So, this work basically started in uh, 2018 when I decided um, that I wanted to apply the concept of environmental justice to Lisbon's greening strategies. At this point, um, the, uh, Lisbon had just been elected as European Green Capital 2020, and I wanted to explore um, what were the strategies and developments that had led to this title and also to what extent the benefits of these sustainability interventions were distributed across the city. And then um, while I was working in Lisbon, I became involved in a Horizon 2020 research project with a very long name, um, but the short abbreviation ROC, so the ROC project. And here I started to work with Mafalda, who um, actually has been doing this research, has, had joined the project already in 2017. And she's been very much focused on uh, participatory processes and uh, governance of stakeholders on, uh, uh, within cities. Um, and so because of the ROC project, we started to focus more on one specific area of Lisbon, namely Marvilla, which is this eastern waterfront neighborhood. And, um, and the Marvilla is a very interesting territory because on the one hand, it has one of the lowest green space levels, the lowest level of green space coverage in the whole city. Um, but on the other hand, Marvilla is also very much known for its many vacant lands. Um, so a lot of mainly municipally owned plots that are awaiting development. And these vacant lands have over the years become informally used by residents, uh, mainly for allotment gardens, but also as playgrounds, meeting points, and uh, sometimes parking places, uh, a variety of functions. And so um, because of the rock project, we had the opportunity to um, um, zoom into one specific um, grassroots initiatives, um, which we're going to talk about later. But this grassroots initiative was trying to get a new public green space to be built in Marvilla. And so it was really 
um, a combination of factors that allowed us to kind of research on the one hand the um, Lisbon screening strategies on a citywide level and then on the other hand um, a more localized perspective uh, and also the possibility of public participation in greening interventions. So um, we're going to proceed with just quickly providing you uh, our understanding of environmental justice and we're going to link this uh, to urban greening. Um, so pointing out a couple of the main issues of urban greening for justice. And then um, we're gonna give you context of our research. So first of all, Lisbon as European green capital. And then uh, second, uh, we're gonna present to you Marvilla as our more localized case study. And then we will in the end provide you a couple of the main findings of our research and what we understand as the most important takeaways for today. And so um, jumping right into some theory. So urban greening has definitely been a very prevalent tool for cities uh, trying to become more sustainable. Um, it's very widely acknowledged that urban greening provides a lot of benefits to cities in the name of ecosystem services, which are increasingly important in the context of climate change adaptation. And in the case of Lisbon, we're talking mainly about, for example, the reduction of the heat, urban heat island effect through green spaces. And and so many cities around the world have actually tapped into this greening agenda and started to uh, widely develop new urban green spaces. Um, what an environmental justice perspective brings into this debate is the understanding of how those benefits of urban greening are actually distributed across the population and across the city. Um, the theory behind environmental justice for those of you that are uh, not very familiar with the concept is it's based very much on the general theories of justice. So John Rawls conceptualization of just distribution, um, Nancy Fraser's work on recognition, but also for example, Iris Marion Young who developed work on structural inequalities. And based on this, um, we've taken our understanding of environmental justice from David Slosberg, one of the main scholars in the field um, who talks about the distinction between distributional justice and uh, procedural justice. And generally speaking, we understand environmental justice as an approach that exposes patterns of inequality and, um, and injustice in environmental decision-making processes. Um, so how does this relate to urban greening? So first of all, research has pointed out that um, the spatial distribution of green spaces in cities is often unequal, but also related to already existing socioeconomic inequalities. So those less privileged are also those uh, with limited access to green spaces. So that more from a distributional perspective. And then we also have others pointing out how um, access to green spaces is not only related to uh, proximity or distance, but also related to the physical quality of the green space. So another issue preventing some people to access those green spaces. Um, another interesting point that has been pointing out by research in this field has been the, um, the process where greening interventions actually um, lead to gentrification and to displacement and in some cases social exclusion. So in this case, um, it's actually the greening that kind of exacerbates or reproduces already existing inequalities. So we will not go into detail into all of these examples, but if you are interested, you can uh, look up the references in our paper. And so what does this mean for our research specifically? First of all, our understanding of, in our understanding of environmental justice, the idea of procedural justice has shown itself to be increasingly important. So in order to understand the injustice that are reproduced, in this case through urban greening, um, it is also important to understand the social political processes behind those injustices. Um, and mainly the inability to access or to be recognized in the decision-making process is a, a large source of injustice because on the one hand, it leads to uh, unequal processes. 
so unfair processes uh, of decision making, but also it reproduces injustice because some people will not be recognized or will not be taken into account when making decisions on urban greening. And the second point that we would like to point out is the fact that we see environmental justice very much as an exercise of multiscalar governance. Um, and this is um, important for our research because, for example, we, what we see with urban greening is that there's a very clear influence of the global urban sustainability agenda on local city planning processes. So for example, the European Green Capital Award, which was won by Lisbon, um, functions as a sort of supranational agenda setting tool because it promotes certain ways of greening. Uh, in this case, mainly greening related to green infrastructure and, um, and a focus on environmental engineering solutions. So that agenda has an impact on how Lisbon develops its greening, but also um, on the other hand, we have the fact that the benefits of urban greening are not only related to the local scale, but are also enjoyed by other people uh, on a wider scale. So, for example, greening can create impact on a citywide scale or even on a regional scale. So, geographical proximity is not the only factor determining to what extent one can enjoy the benefits of urban greening. And if we take this further, then um, we can look at Lisbon uh, as, um, as very much a context where these different um, geographical interactions take place. So on the, one of the main aspects highlighted by the jury um, when electing Lisbon as European green capital was its development in green infrastructure. Um, so Lisbon has actually been developing a system of green corridors uh, it's been part of its master plan already since 2012, so it's not something very recent. And the work is still ongoing. Actually, at this very moment, there are a couple of very large greening projects being developed in the city. Um, we see a couple of renderings on this slide, which, um, which show the kind of green spaces that are being shown. And I think these renderings are interesting because it gives a pretty good impression of the type of green that is being developed by Lisbon. Um, well, first of all, it's always funny to notice how suddenly all the cars have disappeared from the landscape. But then also, if you look at it closely, it's kind of this, it gives a certain vibe of renaturing the city uh, as if what is being developed is a sense of unplanned nature. And um, as I said, this work has been ongoing over the last couple of years, but it certainly received a very significant political boost um, after the city winning this European title. So actually, um, one of the initial plans of the city was to open a new public green space every month of the year 2020 to celebrate its title. Um, unfortunately, this, this plan has kind of been interrupted by the whole global pandemic, but that was the initial, initial idea. So it gives you an understanding of how this title actually impacts greening uh, on a local citywide scale. And then before we dive into the more localized context of Marvilla, I just want to give you a brief overview of what actually happens on a citywide level in Lisbon. So these two, ma these two maps are taken from a municipal report published in 2016, which analyzes um, the distribution of green spaces across the city. And so, um, for example, what you see on the right map is um, uh, the, the, the locations in the city that are within a certain distance to the existing green spaces. And so all the spaces that fall behind um, are kind of not accessible in terms of green spaces. Um, what these kind of spatial uh, illustrations do is that they translate access into distance. So, for example, one of the policy aims of the Lisbon municipality is for 90% of the population to live within a 300 meter distance of a green space. Um, and this is significant because it means that other kind of um, uh, factors or aspects of distance are not being taken into account. 
so these kind of maps do not show to what extent the green spaces are actually accessible in terms of infrastructure, equipment, safety, comfort, um, different uses, different functions, etc. And um, at the same time, also one thing that we've noticed when looking at greening interventions on a city scale is that public participation is very limited or even non-existent. So uh, actually January this year, a new park opened in Lisbon and it's now one of Lisbon's largest public parks. And when interviewing the responsible landscape architects of this park, it uh, became clear that actually no form of public involvement or public dialogue had taken place during the design process. So the landscape architects would only communicate with the responsible team of the municipality, but not actually with the residents or the future users of this park. And if we think about this from an environmental justice perspective, then it becomes clear that urban greening on itself does not, does not necessarily lead to social benefits for everyone. Um, and it can actually create negative effects on the already existing social dynamics. Um, so if, if these kind of aspects of greenings are not ta being taken into account, then um, there need to be more localized solutions that do provide people with the opportunity to intervene and um, participate in the decision-making process. So I'm going to pass the word to Mafalda my co-author, and then she will present to you the case of Marvilla. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so now we zoom in in Marvilla, that it's a particular area of the city of Lisbon that has uh, been experiencing huge uh, urban transformations uh, over the last years. And as Jessica has mentioned, uh, it was also the, the chosen area for the implementation of, of the rock project where We've both been working in, in the last few years. So, um, Mervilla is a post industrial area in the eastern um, riverfront uh, of Lisbon. And uh, after the, the deindustrialization um, of, the, of the area, the, uh, the, this space, this neighborhood uh, in the city has been uh, um, kind of in standby for many years, like waiting for something to, to happen after all the factories was, were closed down. Um, and now after, like in the last decades, the last 10 years more or less, uh, it has been seeing a lot of different interests in the area, like from the economic, from an economic perspective and also from a political perspective. And uh, now I think five years uh, from now, uh, the former um, industrial buildings uh, in this area of the city have been reconverted into other uses. So uh, former factories were transformed into creative spaces and creative hubs and co-working spaces. And also a lot of uh, vacant area in this area of the city was used to, uh, new, to build uh, new real estate projects directed uh, mostly to upper and middle class uh, populations. This in the, in the riverfront area. And on the upper um, area of Mervilla, uh, which is the area that uh, where the, um, most of the factory workers, uh, people that used to work in the factories uh, in the river um, front used to live. Uh, so this area has been uh, rec uh, reconverted into a social housing uh, neighborhood where these former workers and also other, uh, other people from, from different areas of the city and also immigrants um, that came to Lisbon in search for better work and living conditions. Uh, so this social housing uh, area was, was built to, to accommodate these people. So we have very different uh, realities in Riverside of Mervilla and in the upper part of Mervilla. And these um, different realities are even uh, made more uh, are even more divided by two train lines that separate this neighborhood in two and help separating the upper part of Mervilla from the riverfront. Um, so as Jessica was also uh, mentioning before, uh, because this urban transformation of the area happened in very different phases, uh, the area has a lot of vacant plots that are very attractive uh, for different proposals. So in the riverfront area, 
uh, they are being uh, uh, so this uh, these vacant areas are being uh, used to new constructions as we can see in the pictures on the on your left and on the upper side uh, of the of Mervilla uh, they have been used by the neighborhood as Jessica said mentioned before for different uses so some of them are used as uh, um, places for gardening others are used as places for kids to play and um, yeah they are all waiting in the upper part they are waiting for something to happen in these plots and there are very different uh, aspirations uh, regarding what these plots can become you can change slide jessica thank you so our case study um, is focused on a particular process that uh, we followed in Mervilla. Uh, since we were working on with Brock, we, we started to collaborate with a local community group called Quartkrescent, that in English is called Fourth Crescent, uh, I think. So uh, this community group uh, is uh, composed by residents and local associations and local institutions that have been working for a while in this area of the city. And uh, during these meetings of, of the Fourth Crescent, uh, it became evident that one of the main needs identified by the, neighbor, uh, by the residents and by the participants from, from this community group was the lack of, uh, of public spaces, of public green spaces uh, more specifically, where residents could meet and where kids could play and like, general places for uh, the, neighbors, the, the neighbors to socialize. And, um, and this, I think, became a bit more evident because they were seeing also in the riverside of Mervilla a lot of new uh, developments happening, including new green spaces. And while in the upper part of Mervilla, uh, it seemed that everything was more or less the same. So they started to, to demand and to think that uh, in this area of the city, uh, there was also a lot of needs that were not being responded. So uh, since um, so Lisbon has this um, this program that is that uh, is um, happened every year in the cities is the participatory budget. That it's a program that also exists in other cities. And so the residents decided to make an application to this participatory budget of the city to to propose the creation of this new green space uh, for the area. Of Mervilla. So they decided to make two applications for the same project. Uh, one application uh, to the Lisbon participatory budget, to the municipal participatory budget, and another application to the parish council participatory budget. So there is there is two budgets. You can apply either for the general budget from the municipality and uh, or you can apply to the more localized uh, participatory budget from your parish. And in this case they decided to apply to both so in order to give more opportunities for for their project and for the idea to to be funded to get funded um, in terms of results uh, there were contradictory results to these applications so the application to lisbon to the municipal participatory budget was rejected because uh, the residents had identified a plot where they thought uh, the garden could be created so in, in their perspective it was the the, the more adequate space for this garden to be built. And uh, the municipality had already other plans for this uh, plot. So the plot was empty for many years. So nothing was happening in this space, but there were intentions from the municipality uh, to build more social housing in that area. So this application was rejected because there were these intentions uh, in the municipality to build the social housing, more social housing in this area. But the application to the parish council participatory budget was accepted. But with a condition that the residents would have to find another space, would have to identify another space for this garden to be built. However, um, uh, through these meetings and through a lot of conversations that uh, the application to this process, to this project has uh, had uh, 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 stimulated in the area, the residents were really engaged and committed with this idea. So 
the contradictory results of these applications, of both applications, they created a, a sense of, uh, of uh, propose, uh, let's say, in the residents. So they decided to, to uh, argue for, for, um, for the need for the garden to be built in the space that they had identified. So they organized a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, public discussions about this project. Um, in order to, to, to make the municipality understand that uh, a garden was a priority for the specific area of the city and that uh, yeah, they deserved to have uh, this garden in this particular area of the city. Um, you, can, you can change the slide. Let me just... um, so, what does this um, what does this um, what can we learn from this process um, so as we carry our, our research in Mervilla and follow the development of this greening project we can understand uh, that the concept of uh, environmental justice uh, becomes increasingly uh, useful to understand what uh, what was going on in Mervilla and the challenges and opportunities uh, from this uh, proposal from the community group. So uh, we notice how the struggle from the Quart Crescent uh, to have their voices heard and their particular needs acknowledged by decision makers uh, bring light to challenges uh, regarding the recognition uh, of citizens in decision making proce um, process, processes uh, spaces, as Jessica was was saying before. Um, it also became evident how available forms of participation, in this case the, the participatory budget and other initiatives that uh, aim to promote participatory, participatory governance, um, how they, how they uh, sometimes are not effective enough and uh, how it's very hard to put participation into practice in effective ways because it's not a very, um, it's not a very usual practice for urban planners and for architects uh, from municipalities to to really integrate and involve citizens in um, in decision making. Um, however, due to uh, strong citizens uh, mobilization, um, they were able to to have their to make their claims heard and and considered. By, by municipal workers, but this is not a uh, very, uh, it's not a very usual way of uh, municipal technicians, uh, namely architects and planners, to, to, to consider uh, while implementing these green, space, this green spaces in the city. Uh, furthermore, uh, the way in, in which different political agendas overlapped and came in conflict with each other, on the other hand, the agenda of the community group wishing up for a winning project based on true and effective participation, the agenda from the municipality uh, and from different uh, departments from the municipality, namely uh, the, the wider agenda that, uh, um, that was in line with the European Green Capital ambitions, and then the, the agendas from the uh, Department for Housing uh, of the municipality, uh, and other agenda from urban planners that are used to implement these projects without involving uh, so much citizens. Uh, so all these agendas were kind of in conflict in this particular process and uh, how these competing interests led to internal municipal tensions uh, resulting in increased bureaucracy and delays uh, throughout the project. Also, we could learn how forms of resistance um, in this case, uh, how the community group through their claims and through their organized efforts uh, were able to, to call attention and to uh, empower, let's say, the agenda from, from the residents and how these grassroots movements can be effective vehicles uh, to call attention to existing inequalities in urban policies and governance. Uh, so when referring to participatory governance today, uh, we mostly, um, there's a tendency to focus mainly on uh, official formats of participation, so like the participatory budget and other uh, 
uh, consultation mechanisms that exist in cities. Um, but many authors have been calling uh, for a wider consideration of these alternative um, expressions and solutions that are put forward by grassroots movements. So, for example, Carmel, uh, in, his art in her article of 2008, Unpacking Participation, she makes a clear distinction between uh, what she calls uh, invited spaces for participation. So these invited spaces are these official uh, spaces of participation, like a participatory budget or uh, participatory forums that are created uh, by decision makers in order to consult or, or uh, invite citizens to, to give their opinions. And uh, the autonomous spaces for participation, they are created by citizens themselves. Uh, uh, based on a common need and a common challenge that they need to address. So these spaces are addressed, so are created for citizens themselves to address common concerns. And so they are structured and controlled by the citizens. And uh, um, these spaces like the Quartz Exchange Community Group, uh, they can, because they are created by the citizens, they manage to be much more democratic and um, and much more diverse in terms of the participants that uh, are part of these groups and also the ways that citizens can actually participate and make their voices heard throughout uh, throughout the process um, you can you can change the slide jessica thank you so um what this case also shows us is that putting effective forms of participation into practice uh, goes, beyond uh, goes beyond implementing uh, these programs, uh, such as the participatory budget, as I was talking about. Because fair and just procedural processes uh, in which those that are affected by decision-making process, processes can actually contribute uh, to, to the decisions that are made. Uh, requ requires a long-term commitment from both public authorities and local communities to create truly democratic and representative platforms in order to uphold constant dialogue between the different parts involved. So the community group Quartkschent has managed to create this platform uh, uh, in, in uh, it's, it's what our research shows and due to its horizontal nature uh, it allows members to to be empowered so to become recognize and to make their voices heard uh, and also to contribute equally uh, to the decision making process so we have noticed uh, during our participation in these meetings how a lot of times uh, there were there were different perspectives and there were different opinions also between community group members but through a, a real effort to uh, for exchange and, and dialogue between the different group members um, they were able to to find agreements or to find common grounds or to find consensus at least and so these horizontal uh, spaces for negotiation are really uh, are really what makes the difference in this case uh, however these forms of dialogue uh, are rather uncommon uh, in lisbon and remain generally undervalued especially uh, in cities greening strategy as Jessica was saying it's not at all common in Lisbon to have these platforms and spaces for negotiation and normally decisions are taken in a rather top-down way. So now I will close uh, quickly highlighting our main findings. So uh, the main findings uh, of our research, uh, we uh, so we found out that the horizontal participation platforms, as I was saying, as quantitative are very important for um, in urban greening governance by providing a democratic space for empowerment, dialogue, knowledge exchange, participation, and negotiation of these multiscalar agendas. Another thing that we found is that a wider concern with procedural justice, namely by increasing uh, recognition and participation can have significant impacts in the effort of translating global greening agendas into local contexts by stimulating more informed, adapt, and sustainable adjust outcomes, and by acknowledging and involving different inter interested parts in, in decision-making and in urban greening decision-making. Uh, 
we also uh, conclude that environmental justice is an exercise uh, of multiscalar governance where different scales and needs need to be acknowledged and articulated and where citywide urban greening visions need to respond to contextual challenges and needs. And finally, uh, we found that uh, there is a need to uh, integrate issues of, of environmental justice, namely of procedural justice, into international um, sustainability, sustainability agendas, such as the one put forward by the European Grid Capital Award, alongside other ex existing priorities, such as ecological uh, concerns, distributional concerns, energy efficiency, etc. Uh, in order to ensure their environmental justice is acknowledged and improved at different scales. And I will close here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. If, um, if you stop sharing the screen, then we can see everyone. And I'll try to take the spotlight away as well. All right, great. So, um, so thank you both of you for that very articulate analysis. I really enjoyed it and, uh, and I'm sure there are questions. It usually takes a, a few seconds for people to gather their thoughts and you give us a lot to think about and very sort of richly contextualized as well. So let's see if, um, if anybody has questions, just uh, feel free to unmute and put on your video if you like, introduce yourself, or you can type a question in the chat. Or if you have questions in the room, you can come up here and, and speak. And if nobody dares to begin, then I always have questions. So, um, so I, I can go first. Um, I wanted to say that, um, that you came up with some of the, the general principles towards the end that I, was, uh, that I was expecting your talk to lead into. But um, you know, if you were to take them out of this one case context, could you say something about the general principles to ensure the mainstream, the kind of integration of environmental justice into the global sustainability agenda, if you like. How, does, how do those general principles vary across scales? Do they have different implications for what actors should do if they're engaged in working primarily at the local scale, the urban scale, versus if they're engaged in sort of an award like the European Green, Green Capital or in more international uh, level activities and negotiations? Yes, I can take that question. Um, uh, yes, I mean, that's, I think that's a, that's a very important point and that's also one of the main issues that I guess we have been reflecting about when writing this, this paper. And I think that what we kind of understood in Marvilla is that you cannot really, um, you cannot really in this type of interventions, whether it's greening or any other type of sustainability interventions in cities, I think what is important is that you cannot really um, see those different geographical skills as being independent from each other. And um, that is mainly something that, that often happens and is also maybe causing issues at certain places. So if we're talking about the European Green Capital Award, then um, there seems to be very little awareness or attention in relation to how those kind of interventions are actually experimented on a local level and how, uh, how people within a specific neighborhood of Lisbon are affected by these interventions. And then on the other hand, I think that um, also when we were following this process in Marvilla, there is maybe also not so much awareness of how such a new green space in Marvilla would actually impact on a wider city scale or even regional scale or even maybe global scale. So in Marvilla, the focus is very much on um, what is the type of equipment that we need for our neighborhood. And, um, and then um, the, the community group kind of tapped into this green agenda of the city, but um, that was not, that was not 
the initial um, reasoning behind making this proposal, it was really about the very specific needs of people in their everyday life in their own neighborhood. And I think that what environmental justice can kind of bring to the table is the understanding that those different skills aren't independent from each other and do everything kind of works together. And so if you're talking about more global scale, then you need to be aware of whatever you're proposing on a global scale needs to, will have impact on people's life, but also the other way around. Um, so it's very much about interconnecting those different geographical skills. Can I, I'd, I'd like to push a bit further because I, I'm, I think there's also a question here of, uh, of whether there's any sort of follow up, whether there's monitoring. When you have a claim of sustainability of greening, um, does, is there some assessment afterwards that leads us into some kind of consequences? Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is that one of the rich things in your analysis um, to me, it seems to be that it cuts across sectors. So you're not only talking about one sector or another, but many of the times, um, the kinds of indicators that one uses to measure progress on towards targets um, seems to not necessarily be cross-sectoral. So it, there's this assumption that we will do all of these things, but they're not measured in some kind of holistic way. And and I wonder, I mean, you, through the consultations, clearly a, a, an understanding emerges that's contextualized, that's, uh, that, that's aware of these kind of trade-offs. But if you were to imagine doing that without a, the similarly elaborate process for um, recognition for procedural justice in, in sort of every case, then are there ways of being able to monitor, to assess those kinds of cross-sectoral trade-offs um, and progress on advancing not just one agenda at the expense of another. Um, I, I know it's a bit of a big question. Sorry about that. But I wish I had an answer, right? <laughs> no, but I mean, I think the, the whole issue of measuring and monitoring is very significant here. And that's also, I mean, that's also, I think, why the citywide analysis is interesting, because there is very much a focus on spatial data, which is obviously a quite uh, easily quantifiable unit. And in, and and those maps give one part of the story, but definitely not the whole story. But how do you measure, I mean, how do you measure justice? It's, it's not something that you can actually through, um, through specific criteria or um, quantifiable um, aspects that you can integrate into policies. And I think this has been an issue that's been ongoing for a long time and not only in, in relation to cities, but on on very different skills. Um, but it, I think, and, and my father and me, we've talked about this at, at some point, is that we think that the community group in this case brings in a very interesting and significant perspective because the community group is, uh, it's not only made out of residents, it's also, it includes also local institutions, but also, for example, NGOs. And there's also, people from the municipality, so people that work for the municipality that are also members of the community group. So there's a very much an exchange going on between very different levels of experience and also expertise. So, and I think this kind of allows for maybe bridging those differences between on the one hand, we have a very much policy focus uh, intervention where we look at the things that that can be measured, but on the other hand, we have the input from the residents. So I think in our case, the community group was a very nice bridge between those different levels. Uh, hi, is it okay if I ask a question now? <laughs> Thank you, it was a very good presentation and I was very um, interested in, in your topic. Um, I have worked with similar activities um, myself and so I'm, I'm interested in um, did you get any feeling that this could like um, this um, new way of accepting the, the residents uh, applications and um, 
demands. Um, did you get any feeling that this could be replicable in other places, even if they're not assisted by a project like this rock project, um, which I don't know much about, but uh, do you think this could um, change the way that the local municipalities will in the future uh, invite residents to join in? Should I answer? Jessica, yeah. So in the case, in the case of Lisbon, um, in the case of the community group in Lisbon that uh, we have been talking about, um, you can see that happening in a way. And uh, uh, I must say that Rock Project has, didn't have that much influence in the, in the outcomes of, uh, of this uh, application from the community group. So we have no credit <laughs> into, uh, regarding the, the success and the achievements of this uh, particular project. And what happened uh, in, in, with the community group, with the Quartz Kshin community group, is that uh, through their efforts and through their uh, strategies to, to make themselves recognized and heard, uh, they managed to, to call attention and to gain this recognition uh, um, by local decision makers and also by public opinion, let's say, uh, in a more general way. And uh, after this, this project for the garden, that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not finished yet, it's still ongoing. So now the, um, the, the um, application, uh, concurs, how do you say concurs? The test. The context, sorry. The context for, for choosing the, the architects that will implement the project uh, in Mervilla uh, was already launched. And these architects, were, this architect firm was, were, were chosen, was chosen already. Um, and um, in principle, they will work uh, in straight collaboration with the community group uh, to decide uh, what will be built and how and, and et cetera. But besides this, this project uh, of, of the garden, uh, they are also working, the community group is also working in other uh, in other initiatives in Marvila, because this is a territory, as I as I briefly explained, that has a lot of needs and a lot of uh, chance success that this uh, application uh, to the to the garden um, has um, has provoked. Let's say um, there are other projects ongoing now uh, from the community group, and they are collaborating with the municipality uh, in other. In other initiatives, for example, there were a lot of empty stores throughout the neighborhood that were empty for a really, really, really long time. And now, uh, so the residents had to travel uh, by car or by bus or by to go shopping and to do like all the basic daily activities that they need, they had to do outside the neighborhood. And, and now with the pandemic that became like, this was a challenge, but now with the pandemic and with all the restrictions uh, in movement, et cetera, this became uh, even a uh, bigger challenge for them. So now the community group also um, uh, managed to negotiate with the municipality a different, um, a different way to occupy uh, this, this uh, vacant stores. So, to answer to your question, I think I think yes, I think uh, there is this possibility of this kind of uh, horizontal groups if they are well organized and uh, and um, and if they do a consistent work, let's say, uh, to to have a, to gain a wider uh, role role in terms of uh, in the, in the decision making in urban, go in urban governance in cities, I would say. At least that's what we see happening in in Marville. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Any other questions in the room?
I'm tempted. Otherwise, I could maybe just. Uh, for, Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was saying that uh, otherwise, quickly follow up on what my father was saying uh, as well. That I think what we've so because the the issue with the community group is or the strength of the community group is that it's actually very well organized and uh, it has a lot of different skills and resources within the group, but other community groups exist in Lisbon, so it's not a unique, uh, a unique format um, that are much less active and less um, successful in their demands and in their projects. So this is also, I think, maybe something that we can learn is that it, it's really dependent also on the way that the community group is organized and the kind of skills that are available. Um, which then allows for these kind of very strong um, negotiations made with the municipalities, which, which would otherwise probably not have happened. It's a really interesting point. I wonder if it's also uh, partly to do with the materiality of what resources we're talking about and working with mobility, urban mobility in uh, Norwegian contexts and, uh, and struck by the, what it means for the capacity of different kinds of interest groups to organize depending on what kind of uh, mode of transport, for instance, they, uh, they are brought together by. But, um, but I had a different sort of question to both of you. Um, and, and thanks for including a slide. I realized I, I neglected to mention that, of course, you're both uh, doing PhDs, uh, Jessica at the University of Bern and uh, Mafalda at the University of Lisbon. And, um, and I'm wondering what it is that you take from this um, paper into your larger work? If, um, is that a quite direct relationship or is there an overlap and then a different lens? So maybe if you want to talk, uh, talk us through just a brief glimpse of uh, what you're working with and how it relates to these themes. Should I go first? Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, thank you for, for pointing that out. Yeah, so um, I've recently um, uh, in summer started my PhD in human geography and uh, uh, focusing very much on spatial planning. And I think that um, what what I've learned very much is from, from this case is um, how, um, how, how geography has uh, is is so important in understanding these kind of um, issues and these kind of uh, res uh, yeah case studies, let's say. Um, and so I think that um, when when looking at a case in Marvilla and trying to understand its impact on a citywide level or even a larger level, I think it's very important to um, to pay attention to the different geographical skills, but also the different power relations that are related to that. So in the case of Marvilla, we had very much a powerful municipality kind of trying to confront the local community group. And I think that um, we maybe tend to um, always try to find the perfect solution on a local scale. Uh, that's, I, I feel that in some cases that's maybe an, an intuitive direction to look at it as long as we make it as local as possible then um, then we will find an adequate solution but on the other hand we also do have very significant issues playing a role at larger geographical scales so we do have the issue of climate change adaptation and mitigation and we do have a number of very ambitious targets in terms of climate that the city of Lisbon is trying to pursue and and I think where my interest is, is very much in this kind of intersection of these different skills and how and how power plays a very important role in defining the final outcome of this. So currently in my current project, I'm going to try to kind of apply this to the issue of densification. So moving a little bit away from urban greening, not fully, but with a more focus on how densification processes are governed in on a spatial and, and, and power level.
So in my case, uh, my research is not uh, necessarily related to uh, urban greening. I mostly focused on um, global models uh, of urban regeneration and how this, uh, and in policy mobility, so how these global models of urban regeneration uh, are transferred from one place to another and how um, they are translated then on, on local contexts. Uh, and in this case, I'm, I was doing my, my, I am doing my PhD in the framework of the Rock Project. So the Rock Project is, is my case study. And uh, what this research, uh, this research that I, that I developed together with, with Jessica um, uh, had made me uh, understand also about my, my particular research is, um, for example, the Rock Project also had, um, as its aims, this aspect of promoting also urban greening. And one of the projects uh, that was uh, uh, being implemented in, in Mervila by one of the rock partners was also a, a project for, a, for the implementation of a garden, of, of edible garden. But um, this project was based on a lot of um, uh, specific um, ideas and specific methodologies that came from the bottom down, like from the rock project to be implemented in the local context of Mervila, and it found it a lot of a lot of uh, difficulties uh, in implementing this project on the ground. So it was very interesting for me to to follow this process of this project that was supposed to be implemented by the rock project, and then the garden, the, this garden. Uh, project that was developed by the community group in, in an autonomous way by the community group uh, in Mervila. So the challenges faced by, by the two different initiatives and one of them is still trying to, to solve these challenges and, and the, the project from the community group has gone uh, as far as, as we explained you like uh, it's uh, in principle, is going to the implementation is going to, to start uh, in the next months. So how this um, so how how these ideas um, travel from one place to place and how they are then translated and 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 the challenge they encounter and, the, and how ideas are reshaped then in the specific locale is what um, is what really uh, interests me to to observe and it's what this project has also. Uh, made me realize uh, in in a more specific uh, way yeah thank you both for those uh, those responses nicely reflected um a last call for anybody who has a burning question that you haven't yet come up with well, it, seems like you were both very very clear so um before before we sign off and before i thank you i just wanted to say um that uh, that we we're taking a break uh, next week from the governing energy transitions together seminar series but then we do continue we have four more seminars uh, later this semester so the thursdays uh, for the month beyond next week and uh, the, we have a range of speakers and topics. Harriet Thompson will talk about uh, energy poverty and measurement. Um, Marie Martiskenen will talk about uh, um, climate protests and uh, go into the identities of, uh, of those who are part of such strikes. And uh, Shetil Ramatwet will talk about uh, digitization, which is a very important uh, element of uh, energy transitions, uh, focusing especially on robots. And, uh, and then the last one for the semester will be Georges Kallis and uh, co-authors um, talking based on a recent book called The Case for Degrowth. So um, do join us then. But um, before wrapping up, I, I wonder how it works if we try to used to have this tradition of everybody unmuting and, and doing a round of applause for the speakers. So you can try it at the risk that there won't be too many joining in. But shall we on, uh, give a round of applause for Mafalda and Jessica? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Do, if you have any closing reflections, um, you're welcome to say them. But uh, 
If not, then you know, we're all talked out. <laughs> I think so. Thank you very much for Thank having you. us, Sid. Great. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye. Bye.